Okay, so today we're gonna solve a problem that goes all the way back to 300 BC in the days of Epicurus. The problem is as follows. Suppose we have this figure here with these two blue balls of radius one tangent to each other and this red ellipse here called the shaft with a minor radius of one and a variable major radius A. For now, we'll assume A is greater than one. On average, the major diameter is 5.5 inches, but it can vary depending on physiological factors. The problem is to find the remaining area of the blue balls that don't intersect the shaft, so this region here. Since the figure is symmetric, we're just going to worry about this blue ball to the right, but you can easily get the total area of the exposed blue balls by multiplying this area by 2. Now the problem of finding the area of circular intersections is well studied and the solutions are simple linear expressions in pi. For example, suppose we have these two blue balls here which have radius one and pass through each other's centers and we want to find the area of this intersection. We can actually do this with simple geometric observations. If we draw these four radii, they all have length one because they're radii, so these triangles are equilateral with combined area square root of three over two, but these shapes are pi over three radian sectors with one sixth of the area of the whole circle, so this sector has area pi over six, and if we subtract out the triangle, this sliver has area pi over six minus square root three over four. Add four of these to the two triangles to find the intersection area equal to two over three pi minus square root three over two. The situation is not so simple though when one of the shapes involved is an ellipse as we have here. You could proceed in an analogous way and work with the formula for a sector of an ellipse, but in my opinion it's more instructive to just use calculus from the outset. So in the right blue ball, the bottom half is completely uncovered by the engorged shaft and we know that area is pi over 2, so we just need to work with the top half. Let's first write some equations to describe these objects. Let's say that this blue ball is centered at 1, 0, so the top half has the equation root 1 minus x minus 1 squared. Meanwhile, the shaft is centered at 0a, so its bottom half has the representation a minus a times root 1 minus x squared. We'll call the blue ball function b of x and the shaft function s of x. So think about what we're trying to do. We're trying to find the area of the upper half of the circle which is uncovered by the shaft. And anytime we hear area, we should think integration. So if we integrate from left to right, look what happens. At first, this area is bounded above by s of x, but after the point of intersection, it's bounded by b of x. Let's call this intersection point z. And now we can set up this upper half area as the sum of two integrals, the first of s of x from 0 to z, and the second of b of x from z to 2. Now what this problem boils down to is taking an integral of this function, root 1 minus x squared. As you might expect, we can do this using trig sub. So let x equal sine of u with dx equal to cosine of u du. This way the interior of the square root simplifies to cosine u squared and the total integram becomes cosine u squared du. To integrate this, I like to make the simplification cosine u squared equal to 1 plus cosine 2u over 2. And now integrating this gets us u over 2 plus sine of 2u over 4. Converting this back to an expression in x, notice that u is equal to inverse sine of x, so that gets us the linear term. To handle sine of 2u, recall the double angle formula, sine of 2u equal to 2 times sine times cosine, then sine of u equals x, as we already have, and an appeal to Pythagoras gets us cosine of u equal to root 1 minus x squared. This gets us the complete expression 1 half times x times root 1 minus x squared plus inverse sine of x. Let's refer to this from here on out as f of x. We can use this f function to describe the area of the upper half of the blue ball. This first integral of s of x from 0 to z turns into a times z minus a times f of z minus f of 0. We can translate the second integral one unit to the left so that the integand becomes root 1 minus x squared, but the limits are now from z minus 1 to 1 instead of from z to 2. So this integral becomes f of 1 minus f of z minus 1. We can simplify this further by noting that f of 0 is equal to 0 and f of 1 is equal to pi over 4. Now it remains to make sense of this point of intersection z. z is the non-zero point that satisfies the equation s of z equals b of z. 
So we could expand this mess of radicals to find that z is a solution to this quartic equation. And we could be extra and solve this using the quartic formula, but that doesn't really get us any extra intuition. In fact, I'm going to take the unusual step of referring to z as the simultaneous solution to the ellipse equation for the shaft and the circle equation for the blue ball. Here, y is the corresponding vertical component of this intersection point. You'll understand why I'm doing this at the end. So okay, we've represented this area in terms of this weird quartic number z and a function f with inverse signs and radicals. Not exactly ideal, but this is the best we're gonna do. But this only accounts for half of the picture and arguably the least interesting portion. When a is greater than one, we're in the erect regime and the integrals we've used are valid. But when we pass through the total bifurcation at a equals 1, we enter the buried or hidden regime with a less than 1. In the days of Epicurus, these anomalies were unfortunately the subject of great voyeuristic public interest, but today these small a values are easily treatable with surgical intervention. But take a look at why the buried region requires a different integral treatment. As A passes through the total bifurcation, there is exposed area in the blue ball directly above the shaft. And if we work horizontally the way that we had previously, we would need to use the upper ellipse equation as we consider three separate integrals. Though it's equivalent, I'm going to rotate the picture so that the blue ball is on top and the shaft extends horizontally. This way, the area of the exposed blue ball is the total area pi minus this piece here, which is the difference between this upper half ellipse equation and this bottom half circular equation. We represent these respectively as s of x equal to root 1 minus x over a minus 1 squared and b of x equal to 1 minus root 1 minus x squared. This area then is just the integral from zero to a new point of intersection z of s of x minus b of x. I won't bore you with the details because it's essentially the same procedure as in the erect regime. And you end up with a total exposed blue ball area that looks like this. Pi minus this big thing. A times f of z over a minus 1 plus a times pi over 4 minus z plus f of z. And now z and the corresponding y are simultaneous solutions to these two equations. If we're being honest, this is kind of an unsatisfying solution. We're expressing the exposed area of the blue ball with inverse trig functions and quartic solutions. It's just ugly. Let's say we want to take this a step further, however, and find some kind of critical value of a aside from the total bifurcation at a equals 1. More specifically, what if we could find a value of a that minimizes the area of the exposed blue ball? How would we go about doing that. Well, first thing you should probably figure out is which side of the total bifurcation a smooth optimum occurs on, if at all. Looking at the graph, it seems like this should happen in the buried regime, so we'll work with those area representations. Then you'd want to set the first derivative of the area function with respect to a equal to zero. Let g of a be this area function, so we're looking for values of a such that g prime of a is equal to zero. Now that sounds pretty simple, except g depends on those f functions, which also depends on some quartic solution z. So this might be a little harder than we anticipated. But recognize that z is a function of a, right? Because z is a solution to this quartic equation, which depends on a. And now the key step is going to be treating the z as an unknown to be solved for along with a. So the area function is now a function not just of a, but of both a and z. And when we take a derivative of g with respect to a, now we're in chain rule territory, so we also need to consider the derivative of z with respect to a. I know I said this is going to help, but this looks even worse because now this equation of the area function derivative equal to zero depends on both a and z as well as the derivative of z with respect to a, which we're going to treat as the third unknown variable. So three unknowns, one equation. But it's not really one equation because we have more that we can work with. Remember that z is the x-coordinate of the intersection of the blue ball and the shaft. So it's a simultaneous solution to these two equations along with y. So okay, that's definitely better. Now we have three equations with four unknowns, the extra unknown being this derivative of z with respect to a. But now we can take derivatives of these two new equations with respect to a so that we have five equations and five unknowns, those being a, z, y, z prime, and y prime. Okay, we just went from one super complicated equation with a single unknown to five arguably simpler equations with five unknowns. Maybe that doesn't seem like an improvement to you, but check this out, ready? This is a polynomial, 
this is a polynomial, these two are also polynomials, and lastly, this derivative of g, g the function with inverse trig components, can also be expressed as a polynomial because inverse trig derivatives turn into radicals. <laughs> So that's the extent of the ancient geometry problem from Epicurus. This problem was later revived in the 1800s when Dirichlet modified the shaft curve by including a function sometimes called the Dirichlet glans kernel.